This morning it's my purpose to bring everything that I have ever preached in the past down to a living companionship with God. The uh, term that I've just expressed, everything I have ever preached, it's something that I have uh, appreciated from the book Ministry of Healing, page 514. There in paragraph 1, it says, The mere hearing of sermons, Sabbath after Sabbath, the reading of the Bible through and through, or the explanation of it verse by verse will not benefit us or those who hear us unless we bring the truths of the Bible into our individual experience. The understanding, the will, the affections must be yielded to the control of the Word of God. Then, through the work of the Holy Spirit, the precepts of the Word will become the principles of the life. Now this statement we must understand and I will bring our attention back to this statement again as we proceed here because as we hear the sermons and as we read the Bible many people still do not find the uh, true benefit of all that. And I'm hoping and praying that, that the benefit of this will be reached out for by us individually as we are in the presence of God today. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. And we read there some very wonderful words. God is speaking. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through to 13, where he says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end then shall ye call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I love the next beginning of the next verse. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. How did you receive those words? Was there a little niggling thought, well, they're lovely words to whomsoever God is speaking. In fact, if I read it in context, it says that he is speaking to Israel. Verse 10, it says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. And then, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. So, well, 
God was speaking these words to the children of Israel. Or if you come to Jeremiah 33, there are some very beautiful words there. Very personal words. Just as we were just reading before. And here he says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Very personal there, isn't it? He's speaking to who? Well, somebody else, not me. If we really believe that these words are being spoken to me personally, we would enter into a completely different experience. But all too often, people read these words as a general address. We read also these beautiful words of Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord, while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Couple that with those words of Jeremiah. If you will call upon me, I will answer you. You will be, I will be found of you. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon Very wonderful words. But sadly, in my ministry, I still hear and see that people are not taking these words in their continuing experience. They come with a deplorable, overwhelming sense of guilt and unworthiness that tends to weigh them down when the Lord is speaking. When the Lord says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I will come into him and sup with him. Signs of the Times, October 6, 1887, there in paragraph 9, is there one who will say, I am so sinful that this does not mean me. Put away such thoughts. Christ will accept you polluted by sin, though you may be. If you will come to him with contrition of soul, he invites you to come into the light of his presence. Into what? He invites you, me, if we will come and respond to the personal work of his word, we will come into the light of his presence. As I read here, and I am so sinful that this does not mean me. How many times this thought overwhelms us. Oh yes, everybody else is doing fine. It's not meaning me. I'm too bad. I'm not capable of reaching out for God because I am not being addressed here. This is for Israel. This is for all the other people, not for me. 
But remembering that statement, put away such thoughts that it does not mean me because I am too sinful. Mark the words of the apostle to the Athenians. Who were they? The people of Athens. Who were they? They were heathen. And what does he say to them in Acts 17? There you can see that he is speaking to them on Mars Hill, that place of pagan worship. Oh, they were too bad. Acts 17, verse 22. There it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. What a place to find him. Why is he preaching there? In this heathen temple. And he said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all the things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. And so he is preaching to whom? To stark pagans. And what does he say in verse 27? And 28. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. What is he saying to these stark heathens? You should seek the Lord. You might feel after him. Why? Because he's very close to you heathens. He didn't say it that way. <laughs> but that's the, that's the message that's coming here. God is very close to the heathens as well as you and me. He's not very far away because in him we live and move and have our being. Am I too sinful to believe that? Am I too sinful to receive that? Let me read some more as we consider the privilege of my Lord and I. Let's read from that I may know him, page 280, where it says, in paragraph 3, There is danger of not making Christ's teachings a personal matter, of not receiving them as though they were addressed to us personally. That is our danger. That we do not acknowledge them as being addressed to me personally. In his words of instruction, Jesus means me. I may appropriate to myself his merits, his death, his cleansing blood as fully as though there were not another sinner in the world for whom Christ died. So what is your danger? What is my danger? That I'm reading the Bible and I'm reading it separate from speaking to me personally. And as I read the Bible... And God is speaking the way I have just read there in Jeremiah 29. What did he say there? I have thoughts toward you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Have a look at your life honestly as you hear those words, as you read them. They are speaking to you personally. To me personally. And I must actually apply my mind as 
God speaking to me personally. My thoughts are not your thoughts, he says. I will abundantly pardon, no matter what you are like, no matter what you've done. Wherever you are, you might be a stark heathen. doesn't matter. I'm close to you. I am looking for you. Are you taking my words personally as addressed alone to you? Testimony Volume 6 really places the exercise very powerfully into focus here. And if, you've, if you feel that you know, oh, you're a bit weary of reading the Word of God, it's getting heavy and I've been busy all week and I'm very weary right now, Focus on this and you will come alive. Because when I'm reading the Bible, as we are here right now, who is speaking to me? Testimony, Volume 6. And I'm reading here from page... 393 if we really took hold of this we would make strides we would leap into amazing victories page 393 paragraph 1 and 2 it says the Bible its living principles are as leaves of the tree of life for the healing of the nations. The word of the living God is not merely written, but spoken. The Bible is God's voice speaking to us just as surely as though we could hear it with our ears. If we realized this, now right, we're right in the presence of God right now. In the presence of whom? And we are to realize something? If we realize this, with what awe would we open God's Word? With what earnestness would we search its precepts? And as you're sitting here in the, in, the, in the service of God, you would be listening with such intense attention and diligence that you couldn't even go to sleep. Because God is speaking to me as it goes on. The reading and contemplation of the scriptures would be regarded as an audience with the infinite one. What? Audience with the infinite one. So such words often quoted amongst us means little anymore. But if you really stop to think, infinite one speaking to you personally, speaking to me, trying to communicate His love and His power and His sustaining grace to a sinner like me? Oh, how can I go to sleep? How can I go, oh, oh, oh. Mm. impossible, it's wide awake. The, the infinite one. I'm in the audience with the infinite one. It goes on to say, when Satan presses his suggestions upon your minds, we may, if we cherish, I thus saith the Lord, be drawn into the secret pavilion of the Most High, into the temple of God, into his presence. Because I cherish the thought that he is speaking to me personally in every item of God's word. 
doesn't that reverberate through your system and wake you up? All that is written in the Bible and amplified through the words of the Spirit of Prophecy has one purpose in it. The infinite God, the majesty of, of the universe, the Most High, is trying to communicate His love and His power to us to save us. Let's read it there in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 3 to 6. And there, speaking of what God wants to do, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. What does He want? What does He want of you? Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Who did he give himself a ransom for? Is anyone missing out of the word all? And it makes it very personal. So what is God's personal quest what is he urging upon us? You who are sinners who are doomed to die, I want you all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth of me, of Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for the sinner such as the one who feels this can't be me. All. And very powerfully reiterated by Apostle Peter in Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three, reading verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. You know, people sort of say, huh, you Christians have been saying that Jesus is coming. Well, how long have you been saying that? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to us would. Why? What's he trying to tell us? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is the desire of God, the infinite majesty of the universe, trying to speak to you personally, trying to reach my inmost responses as I stop to register this. What? What does he want? John 17, verse 3. John 17, verse 3. What does he want? He wants us to be saved, remember? And this is life eternal. What does he want? That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. What does he want? He wants you and me. He wants me. This is the way we are to take it. He wants me to come to the knowledge of truth. And what is the knowledge of the truth? the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. And this is life eternal. To know Him. Not to know about Him. Yes, you've got, first got to know about Him so that you can get to know Him. But once you've come to know about Him, what does He want? He wants you and Him to know each other intimately. 
And that's why Jesus became so intimate with us in becoming at one with us. With whom? The sinner. Who cries out, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus, the Son of God, cries that out. How close does he want to come to us? And what is written in James 4 verse 8? James 4 verse 8. Because what we read there, I will be found of you if you will seek for me with all your heart. This is him speaking to you. Not to me, to you. Don't think just about the, the other person who's reading it. It's personally speaking to me. I'm in the audience chamber of God and I'm hearing him personally speaking to me. And what does he want? As it says here in verse 8, Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw nigh to God. He's speaking to people who are, who are double-minded. He's speaking to people who are sinners. And he says, I want to draw nigh to you. Will you draw nigh to me? Oh, but that doesn't mean me. I'm too sinful. Can you see the mentality? Do you notice, do you get the impression that God is a lover of companionship? Is this what you're picking up here? God is a lover of companionship. Look at the expression of his heart as represented by Jesus himself. Jesus was the epitome of God himself on earth. And here he speaks in John 17. And what does he say? John 17, verse 24 and 26 to 26. This is the heart of God. He is communicating to you and me, and especially to you, what his heart is to you. It says, in verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my, my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. What are you reading? What is God saying to you? I want you. I want to have companionship with you, he is saying. The same companionship that exists between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are three beings who love companionship. And they have demonstrated their desire to me individually. I want to have companionship with you. The same intimacy that was the love and the glory that exists with the Father and the Son. This is God. To know that 
is eternal life. And to know it in living practice is eternal life. Not to know about that. It is those that took this in and made it their own that expressed it this way in 1st John chapter 1 1st John chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 here it is that John was a representative of this outcome and he wants everyone <coughs> to have this. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life. What was eternal life? To know God. We want to show it to you. That eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. What for? What's the scripture all for? What is it for? That truly our fellowship that sorry, that you also may have fellowship with what? With us. What's that mean? Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These disciples had found the fellowship. And now they are saying, we are telling you an experience of companionship and fellowship which we want you to have. And we tend to think, well, hmm, that's nice. Wake up. This is me. It's for me. And unless you do this, you will not be saved. Simple as that. We will keep on mulling around in our own self-pity, in our own self-sinful negativities that keep on blowing over my mind but that can't blow over your mind anymore when you take it for you personally a personal relationship because the word was with God and the word was God and as you read the word it is God it is Jesus a personal audience with him then what did the word say to the Athenians that you may feel after him? Feel after him? Mm. This communion that he wants us to have, let us spend some very important time in comprehending this feeling after him in personal intimacy. And I read it here from That I May Know Him, reading from page 246. That I May Know Him, page 246. It's a beautiful title, Drawing Nigh to God. And here in paragraph 2 it says, We should seek to understand what it means 
to draw nigh to God. He quoted James 4 verse 8. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. We should seek to understand what this means. We are to come near to him, not to stand a great way off. For in that case, we shall not be able to feel the influence of his divine spirit. We are to feel after him. Remember, he's not far away from all of us. We are to feel the influence of his divine spirit. But we will not do that if we keep on permitting ourselves to drift back from him. Those who come, those who came into the presence of Christ, drawing nigh to him, could more readily breathe in the atmosphere that surrounded him. They could catch his spirit and be impressed with his lessons. We are engaged in a solemn work and we should seek to be in that humble position to have that teachable spirit that the Lord can impress our hearts and that we may feel his drawing power. We never draw nigh to God but that he is drawing nigh to us. So the fact is he's not very far away from all of us as we read. And what is he trying to do being part of us? In him we live and move and have our being. And he was my brain, my mind, all occupied with everything else but the intimacy that he already has with me. I always say to people, feel your pulse. And realize, uh-oh, if that stops, I'm dead. That's how close God is to you and me. But then, why don't you stop to take it in? Why don't we actually cherish and pursue that intimate appreciation? Because he is saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's right at the very heart's door. He's inside of my body. He's there in my brain. But I'm not letting him into the crevices of my own self mentality so there is something for me to understand what it means to draw nigh to him what does it mean it is to enter into a conscious presence of Christ so that I can breathe his atmosphere that surrounds him catch his spirit and be impressed with his lessons. You know what it's like. You're in your own little area of life and then you come into the presence of somebody who has a very imposing atmosphere. And you may like it or you may dislike it, but you are in that presence and if you like it, oh, you like to get closer, don't you? Don't get too close to any human being who is not close to Jesus. Danger there. Get very close to Jesus. Feel his atmosphere. Stay in it. Understand that he is, he is desiring your closeness. So it's, it's safe there. You can get very close. You can let him embrace you. You can let him come right into your being and stay there. You'll see how I conclude here with these precious words. But here it is. So that why does he want to come close to you? To give you eternal life. Not just to give you a good feeling, but so that you would be in a humble position, in a teachable spirit. Unless you are close to somebody that you love, you won't do what they say. 
Because some of the things that the Infinite One wants to say to us is not our ways, but His ways. But you've got to really experience His love and His closeness and be comforted in His presence and then that way which is not your way will be joyfully em embraced. You won't consider all the ramifications of what that will mean because you're in his presence and that's all that matters. We never draw nigh to God but that he is drawing us. So the very fact of actually being called upon to draw near to him is actually his effort because he, as he said there, it is not you that sought me, I sought for you. Remember those words? Wonderful God. Why don't we just go, oh, thank you, Lord, instead of this caginess that we often hold within ourselves. Let's read on on the same book that I may know him, page 144. There in uh, paragraph 4 it says what it means to draw near to him. For those of us who were at the camp, at the camp out last week, we got a little touch of it. It says, The beauties of nature have a tongue that speaks to us without ceasing. Now what was required? for you to get the full benefit of that in nature. The open heart can be impressed with the love and glory of God as seen in the works of his hands. So as you're in nature, unless you open your heart, it will just be lovely atmosphere around you, but it might necessarily be the presence of God. You see, I need to cherish, I need to pursue a deliberate communion. And as God draws near to me in nature, not to take it for granted. Oh yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? And that's all. Isn't that a beautiful scene? Isn't that precious, that way that tree is just situated? Or those lovely flowers. And God's saying, I'm here. I want you to pay attention to me. Will you open your heart to me? Look at my works. I'm right here with you. I want to enter into a deep relationship with you. The listening ear can hear and understand the communications of God through the things of nature the listening ear. It's one thing to hear the beautiful sounds of nature. It's another thing to hear God. And unless we open our hearts, we will do the same as we often do in church. We hear the words and we fall, fall asleep halfway through. And that is what we do in nature. We take things for granted because we don't actually tune in to the living presence of God. There is a lesson in the sunbeam and in the various objects of nature that God has presented to our view. Who has presented them there? God. The green fields, the lofty trees, the buds and the flowers, the passing cloud, the falling rain, the babbling brook, the sun, the moon and the stars in the heavens all invite what? Our attention to and meditation. Not just our attention, but our meditation. And bid us become acquainted with him who made them all. What does it bid us? Come. I want to talk with you. Come closer. Don't stand so far off. Come close to me. He is saying to you personally. And that, that heart of self is always there. Oh, I don't know. 
I'm too bad. I can't quite accept it, but if I will only plunge, God will draw near to me. I will be in the audience of the infinite one. Page 148, paragraph 2, the same book. There, again, it says, If our hearts were softened and subdued with the love of God, they would be open to discern his mercy and loving kindness as expressed to us in every shrub and in the profusion of blooming flowers which meet our eye in God's world. Not just a beautiful picture, but an actual expression of God's mercy and loving kindness so that I can stop and say, Thank you, Lord. Oh, I open my heart to you. I receive you. What can you tell us? Can you tell me? And stay, speak, Lord, in the stillness. I come to the garden alone to listen, to, exp to, to open my heart to receive. It goes on, the delicate leaf, the spires of grass, every lofty tree is an expression of the love of God to his children. They tell us that God is a lover of the beautiful. He speaks to us from nature's book that he delights in the perfection of beauty, of character. He would have us look up through nature. What does he want? He wants to have communion with you. He would have us look up through nature to nature's God and would have our hearts drawn out in love and affection to him as we view his created work. Why am I making such an important point? Why am I straining on this? Because I don't know whether you've got the same problem as I have. But I'm prepared to be in that nature and just get on with what I'm doing. And not until I go, oh, what I've just shared with you. When I do that, and I actually reach out for God's presence in that, then something special happens. But how many times we just go on in our life with our heads down inside of ourselves just concentrating on everything else but His presence. And that's the reason for our problems on this planet. So nature is an area from which God communicates the sense of His presence so that I can joyfully bask in His presence company and feel his atmosphere, breathe in that beautiful character and let it govern me in all its respects. And then in the study of the word, remember audience chamber of the most high. Audience chamber. As I read the word, as I go into nature I am to enter willingly into an intimate fellowship. Desire of Ages, page 668. Desire of Ages, page 668, paragraph 4. <clears throat> and there it says, part of the way down, 664, paragraph 4. It says, um, starts with these, if we come to him, um,
No, that's right. That's that's the one. Sorry about that. That was my 668. That's why I'm looking in 664. <laughs> Uh, 668, paragraph 4, it says, um, If we come to him in faith. How? Come to him in faith. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Our hearts. What? Our hearts will often burn within us as one draws nigh to commune with us as he did with Enoch. Brethren and sisters, the Lord does it. But we often just mull on. In him we live and move and have our being. He wants to come into a close in communication with us and our hearts at times will burn within us as one draws nigh to commune with us. He wants to draw near. My heart will burn with me as I'm reading his word. And therefore those who decide to do nothing in any line that will displease God will know after presenting their case before him just what course to pursue and they will receive not only wisdom, but strength. Because why? You're in the presence of the Omnipotent One. You're actually basking in His closeness. You will receive strength, not only enlightenment. Power for obedience, for service, will be imparted to them as Christ has promised. Whatever was given to Christ, the all things to supply the need of fallen man was given to Him as the head and representative of humanity, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things which please are pleasing in his sight. What is pleasing in his sight? That he wants to save you and me. That is pleasing in his sight. And as, I, as he draws near to me, to, and my heart burns within me, do I say, oh, that was lovely, now I'll get on with my work again. Wait a minute. I am to abide in his presence. That beautiful sense of his closeness must abide. And we so quickly get distracted. And we are so, so quickly impolite with God. You know, what is, if you try to come close to somebody and then they go, oh, look at this and look at that and, and, and he's trying to communicate with you, she, whoever it is, and you just distract yourself from their overtures of trying to commune with you. Oh, how rude. How rude are you with God? Hmm? God wants my full attention. Not for his sake, but for my sake. Because I'm a sinner. And I need his full attention. I, he needs my full attention so that I can walk with him as he wants me to be saved. As it says there, to know what I should do in every given situation. And so we have this, this beautiful statement that came out of the Sabbath school lesson. Did you notice it? Did you notice the closing meditation in the Sabbath school lesson this morning? Here it is. Profound. It says in Christian Education, page 56, God speaks to us through providential workings. He speaks to us through nature, through the word, through the interaction with us, providential workings, and through the influence of his spirit upon the heart. In our circumstances and surroundings, your circumstances and surroundings, how many people have complained to me, Oh, I didn't like this. I don't like that circumstance. I don't like this. I wish it was different. I wish there this and that. In our circumstances and surroundings, in the changes daily taking place around us, we might find precious lessons. What? If our hearts are but open to discern them. Oh, that's the problem. 
open to discern them. The psalmist, tracing the words of work of God's providence, says, The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Psalm 33, 5. And then Psalm 107, 43. Here it is. You want to be a wise virgin? Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. You see, the simple, the short of the, of the whole scene of the ten virgins is that the five wise virgins have opened their inward parts to the closeness of the Lord. They have oil in their vessel. The other ones didn't. They only had oil in their lamps and that went out because the oil in their vessels wasn't there. Closeness. The close relationship with God himself. And now, once we have gained this appreciation of and understand how to connect as we have been reading here and we actually open our hearts to the scenes of nature to the statements of God's word and we feel him drawing near as we draw near to him and we say, yes, this is what I want, Lord. Keep on coming and you keep on opening and you just focus on that and then you say, oh, but I've got to go and do that. No, just a moment. Before you go and do that, stay with me and then I will come and do it with you. Oh, how much we want to hold the reins. I tell you, brethren, if I was holding the reins, I wouldn't be here preaching to you now. There are so many areas of my life that I need this close relationship. It is absolutely imperative to, to exist today. And I read it here in, in Ministry of Healing, page 510. The Ministry of Healing, page 510. It says, in paragraph 1, The reason why so many are left to themselves in places of temptation is that they do not set the Lord always before them. What are we to do? We are to set the Lord always before us. Is that hard when he draws near to us? <laughs> All he wants us to do is to make a choice to set myself constantly in his presence. When we permit our communion with God to be broken, our defense is departed from us. That's why people go and fall apart. Because our communion with God isn't there and our defense is departed from us. Not all your good purposes and good intentions will enable you to withstand evil. You might have good intentions. You might have good determinations. But all that will not succeed. You must be men and women of prayer. Your petitions must not be faint, occasional and fitful, but earnest, persevering and constant. And this will be my next sermon, remaining constant. It is not always necessary to bow upon your knees in order to pray. Cultivate the habit of talking with the Saviour when you are alone, when you are walking, and when you are busy with your daily labour. What? I've got to concentrate on my work, thank you very much. <laughs> if you concentrate on your work with all your good intentions, you will fail because you will lose Jesus' protection somewhere along the way. No, no. Jesus must be with you in your daily labor. Let the heart be continually uplifted in silent petition for help, for light, for strength, for knowledge. Let every breath 
be a prayer. That's being in communion with God. In today's computer world, we can understand it well. My computer right now hasn't got a screen light at all. It's dark. But it's online. And there's continual communication available. And you and I, with our computer up here, are to be online continually. Don't, don't go offline. Stay online. And the Lord will continually flow his presence into your appreciation. And you can switch off or you can switch on. And that's what we do. We switch off sometimes. But this deep sense of the presence of the Lord must abide with me in my daily labor and then I can work well. Then I'm not frustrated. Then I'm able to achieve those complicated situations of life because I'm basking in his presence and he's showing me how to deal with it calmly. And every time I become irritated with something, I might even burst out with something and the sweet voice of Jesus says, what are you doing? Oh, sorry, Lord. <laughs> but if I wouldn't be there in tune with him, I wouldn't even hear him saying, what are you doing? And then he quickly stops us in the path that we were going down to create more and more and more reaction. So let the heart be continually uplifted in silent petition for help in your work, in your experiences, in your sufferings, everything. Lord, here I am. You are the healing of my soul. And here is another beautiful quote from Heavenly Places, page 69, paragraph 5. In Heavenly Places, page 69... There in paragraph 5 it says, We speak with Jesus as we walk by the way. And he says, I am at thy right hand. Oh, mm, you like walking arm in arm with somebody who loves you? Yes, I'm at the right hand. We may walk. We may walk in daily companionship with Christ. When we breathe out our desire, it may be inaudible to any human ear, but the word cannot die away into silence, nor can it be lost. Though the activities of business are going on, nothing can drown the soul's desire. It rises above the din of the street, above the voice of machinery to the heavenly courts. It is God to whom we are speaking and the prayer is heard and then ask and it shall be given you. And my greatest need is to say, Lord, don't leave me. I will not let you go unless you bless me. And as this is done, the Lord takes you through. And then you will experience what is meant in our scripture reading. What was that? Thou wilt show me the path of life. What? In thy presence is what? Joy forevermore. Pleasures. The pleasures of the sense of a presence that is absolutely infinite that is the great majesty of the universe that has for him for him nothing is impossible nothing and for the people of Laodicea for the people of Laodicea this subject that I have just communicated with you is their most urgent priority what is he saying? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, anyone out there, hello, will you let me in? 
This is the most urgent priority to let the Savior in, to have a heart that opens, ears that listen, that receive joyfully the overtures of God's amazing love. If ever there was a time, sons and daughters of God, page 167, paragraph 5, it says, um, if ever there was a time, right at the bottom of the paragraph, if ever there was a time when men needed the presence of Christ at their right hand, it is now. So that when the enemy shall come in like a flood, which he will, haven't you felt it? The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Laodicean time, the people of the judgment. We're being judged. Our sins are before God in the judgment. Oh, we need communion with him. Communion with Christ, it goes on to say, how unspeakably precious, unspeakably precious. Such communion, it is our privilege to enjoy if we will seek it. The everlasting assurance will be yours that you have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. These words nearly bring me to tears. Because I know it to be true. When you're in trouble, when you've broken down, when you've failed in something, that even your brother will turn against you, but not Jesus. Not Jesus. He waits to receive again and again. Who? Even the apostates. Oh, what a God. And so why is it so imperative that at this very time we have such an intimate relationship? Because we are living in a disaster that is heaping upon this, this planet and it is the time of the plagues beginning to unfold before our very eyes, not in their fullness, but already the sprinklings in Sister White's time and now all the more. Psalm 91 verse 1. Here it is. He that what? Dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. The atmosphere, being under a shadow, an atmosphere of presence. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Then He shall surely deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Why? Because it's the truth as it is in Jesus. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. What a precious comfort that is. When everything is falling down around you, you can actually, and I, I was saying this to somebody the other day, it tickles me deep inside in my tummy. You know that tummy wobble laugh? That beautiful feeling of everything falling down around me and I can be safe in his arms. Oh, who can know of this experience apart from those who open their hearts to him? And so it goes on. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand. Why? Verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy what? Thy habitation he your habitation what's that mean 
to cohabitate together with him and stay there. There shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Why? Verse 14, because, because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. That's God speaking. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is dependent upon that little word if. If we will open our ears, our eyes, our hearts to that close relationship. And I want to conclude with the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. And this is the Amen upon this message. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.